Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to the Lighthouse, which is the last of our conversation series for the year. For those of you that are uh, joining us for the first time, we've had now um, almost two years of those conversations, informal conversations with different people uh, from the art, design, and F&B scene. The main theme being cultural entrepreneurship. And uh, tonight we have Joey Dazel to close off the year. Dazel. Hey. Well, I think it is Gazelle. Egyptian. Yes, Egyptian. <laughs> Gazelle. And uh, Joey is a, a, a dear friend and a friend of the Lighthouse and um, one of the inspiring uh, FNB stories over the last couple of years here. Uh, I'll start off very quickly with a short anecdote and then we'll, we'll go into it. Um, I was used to Joey. Joey, four, I don't remember, four or five years ago for a friend. And when we were opening the Lighthouse and he had already successfully opened the main and um, he came here with Henny and I and it was still a construction site and he uh, I said burn it. <laughs> he, he, and I'm going to jump right in with that, he gave us one or two pointers that turned out to be so succinct and to the point and I remember telling Henny at the time that you know one of the things you marvel about and I think something I want to discuss tonight is you know is it an eye or is it an experience, is it a combination of an eye and experience so we'll get to that in a minute. I'll start first, maybe for those that don't know you. Just a little about yourself. Where did you grow up? Who you are? I grew up here. Okay. Um, I grew up here in the 80s and 90s. I uh, went to school here. My father my, my parents were here all the way through to 2005. Um, I've seen Dubai grow. Well, you know, I was here when Sharjah was the big thing. That's right. When we used to party in Sharjah. So you were the by child that you left? I left in 1995. Okay. Uh, I went to university. I studied uh, international relations, politics, and filmmaking. Uh, I was a big drama nerd. So I, I kind of had this dream. I always had this dream of being a filmmaker. Uh, but, you know, negotiated with my father to do uh, international relations, political science instead. And uh, one day he called me up and said, uh, there's no more money. You have to get a job. So the only job people can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? I'm 17. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the only job that I could get really was as a, as a busboy in a restaurant. And I, I kind of fell in love with the restaurant business uh, from a very young age. And I worked, I have honestly worked every position you can imagine. And that was, that was in Canada. In Montreal. Was in Montreal. I lived in London for a while. I worked yeah. at a Soho house group. So I mean, in, as far as restaurants is concerned, I've worked as a busboy, I've worked as a bartender, I've worked as a waiter, I've worked as a manager, I've worked as a concierge, as an event person. Um, I worked in marketing at a group level. Were you one of these chatty bartenders, or like the ones that just like smile at you and then you know make an amazing drink, or both? Uh, no, I was more chatty. I had less skill. Uh, <laughs> as, I, I, I compensated with personality. Okay, really. Okay, good. And then you moved to Beirut. I, uh, in 2008, I decided it was the right time to leave Montreal and I moved to uh, Beirut. Um, I had pretty much learned everything that I was going to learn and I tried my hand at uh, doing my own projects. Look, the big thing about it was that I had a very strong school. Um, it's not that I just you know, worked in a restaurant and I thought I knew everything. But we were, I worked in a group that had 80 restaurants and I was developing three, four restaurants a year. And that is not a small feat. Yeah. So when you're managing marketing for six, seven different brands, each have their own identity, each have their own tone of voice, their own design, their own brand, you start to kind of know how to manage your time. And you know you start having a split personality because you start kind of giving each one what it needs. So I guess one of, one of the, sorry to interrupt you here, one of the questions here is uh, whatever experience you've had, which I've obviously quite a bit in, in Montreal, yeah. Did it freely translate? The reason I'm saying this is a lot of people may have had experience in Europe and the States, come back here, here meaning the Middle East broadly speaking, yeah. thinking maybe there's a bigger opportunity here because there haven't been that many outlets and the kind of level of maybe, you know, advancement that you see elsewhere. Did you find that an actually easy translation or I mean I had the skills and I had the knowledge. You know, people a lot of people think the restaurant business is kind of fun. It's sort of like a luck, fun thing. But it's actually a business, like any business. It has ABCs, you've got to follow those. Um, you, 
uh, have to be quite disciplined. There's a lot of structure and process that you have to follow, a lot of systems. There's a science of I have something that I tell my staff all the time, which is, um, you know, systems run restaurants. People run systems. People do not run restaurants. That's the most famous line in our company. You know, people do not run restaurants. But there was uh, some, sorry to kind of insist on that yeah. point, just because it interests me personally as well. Did you feel there was a culture translation? In other words, your customer in Beirut or now in Dubai is different than your customer in Montreal? Well, it's, it's a different conversation because, first of all, my foundation was strong. I understood how to, how to create restaurants, you know, raise financing, how to look at a location and understand if it's a viable location or a viable opportunity. I know how to negotiate spaces. I know how to raise money. I know how to train. I know how to hire. And I know how to design. But this is me. This doesn't translate to the. It sort of translates to the customer, but in a different sure. way. The customer experience is a totally different skill set. That's when you're designing a brand and you're creating, filling a gap in the market, and you're looking at what's missing, and you're sort of bringing that Canadian sensibility or that, you know, that what you learned in London or what you saw, bringing it to to the different this side of the world. But it's look. I am a. I have a bit of a photographic memory. Uh, when I walk, when Any I travel, other major skills that you know about? no, I. This is. A, I'll tell you. Yes, lots. But um, no, but I do have a photographic memory, and I love to travel. Traveling is my absolute greatest joy in life. Yeah. Because, and I hate traveling to places that do not have a strong food culture. I actually get annoyed, uh, and they don't have a, a great street culture and a great restaurant culture. Because I love nothing gives me more joy than going to restaurants when I travel, because I clock every single pressure point that they have. It could be the way they serve you water, or the coaster, or the arrival experience, or the music, or the lighting, or their china, or the so many different things that make that experience. And I, I, I log and I register all of that for future use. So, um, so, so let's just go back to something you just said because that was kind of the point I wanted to talk about tonight. So you said you'd go into an empty space, let's say. So when you came here, yes. let's just say it was a construction site. Yes. Nothing there. Do you think that do you look at this space and then think, how do I make that viable? The, see what the was first thing that I do is I look at it from a, a commercial viability perspective. Define commercial viability. Like, is there parking? Okay. Can people access it? You know, is there good light? Uh, does it work day and night? Um, you know, is there any catchment? Uh, yeah. You know, are the people, the people in the So this kind of big picture big commercial picture, value. Okay, you know, is, is it something I would be excited about? Right. Yeah. That's my first approach. Okay. Always. Let's assume we take that box. Yeah. But that, that's a must. I yeah. I mean, that's, for me, that's a must. Okay. Because um, if the people are not going to come, I mean, you're just doing it for yourself. After that, then I sort of look at the way the space flows mm -hmm. um, for the customer. Operationally, but also mostly for the customer. So, are they walking through a nice doorway? Is there a nice facade? Are you are you controlling the arrival experience? Like, are you communicating your brand right from the get-go, or do they have to walk into a mall and take an elevator or an escalator, or is it a disjointed experience where it's not your valet or your? There's so many different aspects to it. It's really complicated. And I guess, I, so just to kind of make that on a, a, a practical note, so I remember thinking about that when we were talking about the main, because I came to that as a construction site as well, yes. and you walked me through the garage, Yes. And, and I remember that moment because it reminded me of something that happened to me when I first moved here uh, and bought a house and I had this hideous chandelier, what I thought was hideous, yeah. but then we encased it in lace and all of a sudden something hideous became actually stunning and a talking point. Yeah. And I feel you kind of, it wasn't chandelier, it was an entrance. Yeah. You found something that would be challenging and made it actually a thing. It was actually the number one thing that drew me to the project. Right. So I didn't see it as a challenge. I saw it as an unbelievable USP. So what I'm trying to say is you, you're following a certain Bible of sorts, but you're very happy to adapt as you go along. I yes. Guess. I mean, look, because point. I grew up in Dubai and I've sort of seen the way Dubai has developed. You know, I was in Dubai when Dubai still had liquor licenses on the road, when it, you didn't need to be part of a hotel to have a liquor license. That was when I was, you know, that was when I was young. And then the law changed for whatever reason. And now in order to be able to serve liquor, you need to be part of a hotel, which completely changed the landscape of the city. 
That one like decision the that changed the whole world because, you know, changed the whole city because it changed the DNA because suddenly there was no street bar culture or yeah. street culture or yeah. there's no action on the front. So when you're driving, you don't know what's happening. You don't see people mingling. You don't have yeah. Sanka set like happy hour, people hanging out. At now you have to purposefully go into spaces and, and you have to intentionally arrive somewhere. You have to know where you're going. And that's changing now. So, so similar to you, I grew up in Cairo where you could walk down the street and one of the best experiences there were bars or restaurants where you almost didn't have an entrance and you're walking some, excuse my language, shady street and then yeah. you kind of bump into a place and you, you land yes. and there's a whole scene in there yeah. that's very interesting. Well, is it? So I, I knew when I got to Dubai that there was something that I was looking for, which was cachet. You know, I was looking for cachet. I didn't want to be the same restaurant that you walked into a mall or an office tower or had to take an escalator or an elevator. I wanted cachet. And for me, when I, when I was proposed the location of the main, six people had said no to that location before. <laughs> One guy put a deposit down and still didn't do it because he didn't believe it would work. Um, but for me, when I arrived at that location and it smelled like trash and there was a delivery truck, and there was fish and meat, and, and, her, yeah. and it was it was and it was a garage. And it was just it was completely awful. not, you know. I, I saw it and I just said to myself, you know, but this is exactly it because when you're walking down the street in London or in Paris, this is what it smells like, and this is what it's like. And I love the idea, the juxtaposition, the, the idea of controlling the experience entirely, mm. even before they arrive to the garage, because. The person that's never been there before will arrive and say, are you sure this is the right place? The person that's been there before is waiting for that person to, that, you know, the excitement or the disarmament of that, of that experience because you feel like it's that, oh, I'm in a weird place or I'm in the wrong place and then you walk through the door and you're like, oh my God, I've arrived. It's the total contrast, which is what I, I look for. And I did the same thing at Barber, where you go up a staircase and you kind of feel like you maybe are arriving at a strip club or a brothel or something really naughty, and it says adults only, and it's sort of it sort of could be somewhere, yeah, you know, I'm a stuff, yeah, in the Marais or, or somewhere. <laughs> it is recorded, you know, just so. <laughs> where is this adult? And this is a massive venue. <laughs> yeah, I just you know, but uh, no, I, I get your point. So I remember, <laughs> I remember. Um, that conversation the main and coming uh, as it was opening and 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 I want to transition to interiors we have talked a lot about the different interiors just walk us kind of a little bit through some of the choices made I think it's interesting for people to understand the different pieces of going so I remember the first thing I did is I walked into the bathroom because I thought it would be very addictive and then we spoke about fixtures for a and bath bathroom fixtures and then we spoke about the bar what was driving one you have the space now well, first of all so we have the space I, I've hit all the commercial viability points that right. I was looking for, you know. For me, I was very proud of the fact that people could come out of the car and walk straight into the venue. Right. That, I don't think there's a lot of places other than maybe Buddha Bar, and maybe Zuma, you have to take an elevator, but I could not think of another place in Dubai where you were calling your hands. And that's a huge, unique selling problem. And you entirely forgot that you're in the basement as well. And you don't that care that you're in the basement. I mean, that becomes part of the fun. Right. You know. yeah. But for me, being on the seafront, I knew that I wanted to do a seafood concert. And I've always loved the idea of a New England concept because it, it melds that European and American sensibilities together. And I've always loved the colonial slash Hamptons sort of style because it's white, but it's warm white. You know, and that warm white has always been something that's excited me. I know this was a very weird thing to get excited about, but no, I get excited by warm white. <laughs> Uh, because because it, white is a beautiful um, is a beautiful backdrop, but done properly you can you can do add a lot of texture to it. Yeah. So white could be chandeliers and white washed brick and white painted distressed wood and white birch and you know terrazzo tiles and, and suddenly white doesn't become so white anymore. It's just shades of white. And so that's how I started. Um, I knew that it had to be nautical, but 
were you making all the decisions yourself in terms of materials, in terms of, or were you yes. assembling a team and yes. just getting? And I mean, I have to say, I'm not a designer professional. Okay. But I design my own restaurants because I feel like designers suck the soul. I have two big words in my company. The first word is authenticity. And arriving at authenticity in a place like Dubai is very tough yeah. because everything is new. Yeah. It's, artists, it's yeah. easy in Beirut yeah. or in London when the building has natural authenticity and natural beauty and you're just adding to that natural beauty. It's difficult in Dubai because everything is new. Yeah. Um, the second word that is very important in my company is restraint. Because you have to always practice restraint. Because it's very easy to fall into the trap of becoming concepty and going too far with the concept and the branding and the design so it feels contrived so so we feel try hard so interrupt we here use the similar term of saying the same thing we thought about and remember this in our conversation it being timeless yes. so you wanted a design pattern that's timeless in the sense that it's not trend driven it will be as contemporary today and it's very very contemporary yes. here as well I as it will be 10 years from now i choose materials that age well right there's two things that I do to create that timelessness. So the first is choosing materials that age well over time. So brass and floors. And I like things to look distressed because it gives it a sense that it's been there for 100 years. The other thing that I do is in the branding exercise, first thing I do is practice restraint. So obviously I try not to do too much. And the other thing is that I try to create a brand that feels that it's gone through already several phases. So something that I always do is I always create a logo that is the full logo or stacked logo that would have been done in the 50s. And then I do a logo that would have been done in the 80s. And then I do a logo that's being done in 2000s, which is maybe more modern and more minimal in this approach. And I always do this exercise with branding agencies because it gives me uh, a lot of richness to work with. So when you look at the main logo, the main logo starts as the logo in the box with the stamp and all of the crazy elements in it. And then as you go through time, it becomes more and more simplistic because that's what gives the, the different touch points. You know, people don't notice it right away, but they do when they start seeing the different ways that the logo is applied. Do you care how much people notice these things? So, a simple example, I mean, we, we do a lot of things here, little things yeah. that I think maybe 5% get, but 80% appreciate. Or do you do it because you think it's the right thing to do and then... I, well, primarily I do because I... Right. So that's what I believe I, it's the right thing to do. Right. But, but I also believe that people are smart. I agree. So and people actually see people it. People don't... Or maybe subconsciously even enjoy it without, without spotting yeah, that. I mean, maybe they don't, they don't can't point it out, out but, they, but they feel it. That's right. And I think it's so important the way you make people feel. And it's also part of authenticity because that's what, when you're authentic, people feel you. And when you're inauthentic, people don't feel I feel you feel <laughs> um, it's, it's not about me, but it's about the way no, no, it, it, it feels. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, on, on just kind of segue here a little bit. Um, in terms of making decisions, because it's a lonely business a little bit. Yes. So I'm blessed here to have two partners that I speak to all the time and many yes. others. Yes. Um, brainstorming, making decisions, sometimes without yourself. How do you make decisions and how do you feel it's right? I, so am, the word, I am the worst with this because I, because, I'm, I because I'm not a designer, you know, designers, it, you know, they're being paid to do a project. Right. So they will like package it really nicely, make all the decisions and sell it to you and then spend the rest of their time standing by their decision. Right. Right. Because you paid them. Yeah, you defending paid. that decision. Yeah. yeah. Irrespective of what you know, good or bad, or if it works, or if it's on brand, or if it works with the concept, or anything, just their standard. I, on the other hand, anguish over every single decision I make to the point of like I make myself sick. Like I will like sleep at night thinking it's the best thing I've ever done, and then I'll wake up thinking it's what the hell was I thinking? And and I, I want to burn it all, and then I'm like, but it's you know. In a way, it doesn't matter because it's coming from somewhere honest. And also, I, th I think to make those decisions, it needs to be a little bit laborious. It, 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 if you make it just on a whim, you need to go and then go to the counterpoint yeah. to find the, the last point. I mean, it's funny because I, I sometimes, you know, you, 
you were talking about the eye. I have a certain taste. There are things that, that I like and things that I don't like. Sure. Usually I'll walk into a, a little you know, bistro in Paris and that excites me. Or I'll walk into somewhere that's been overly designed, overly done, and it doesn't excite me. So I know what my taste is. Yeah. I always go for the more the nostalgia. That's what I'm more interested in. I'm interested in that, you know, carafe uh, that is you don't see anywhere else. Or I'm interested in that signage that is looks like it's a gitan signage that's gone out of fashion or nobody knows how to make it anymore. So I'm interested by those things because I'm always I'm always more excited by bringing back a sense of nostalgia. Why do you want to bring back a sense of nostalgia? Why do you think it's important? Is it because you're, is it Dubai specific in the sense that it's a new place and you want to, or is it just generally the way you feel? It's because I feel like we work entirely, well, first of all, because my, my belief is in, in creating these pressure points okay. and how it makes people feel. Okay. And I feel, I feel like people do not feel anything unless it reminds them of something. Okay. So they need reference points. They need reference points. Okay. And this could be you know, those if you've been so to the become main, signposts in a way. Yeah, if you've been to the main, the candle holder on the tables was a big issue. Like it was a kind of like, a, like a, you know, it was like United Nations decision. decision. <laughs> because it was the only time I remember that my, my shareholders, my investors who are silent, got involved in the decision. <laughs> they did not talk about the floor, they did not talk about the walls, they couldn't care less about the chairs. But this candle uh, holder was like suddenly the wall, the whole earth was, was on fire. So lesson to all budding entrepreneurs, do not let your investors get involved in candle holders. Anything else is okay. Well, I don't know why they got involved in candle holders. Um, but for me, you know, I went to a little shop in Chinatown in New York, and I looked through the second hand and all the old stuff. The problem with this is that whatever you buy, it better not break because you're not going to find it anymore. It doesn't <laughs> Um, and I remember finding um, like 10 of them, but I needed like four or something. And I got very excited by the scandal. That's so then I spent the the other three one. months trying to find them. Yeah. But so I, I bought them, and, uh, and you were there, remember? And we put them in a box, and I, should, I paid like three did times more to ship them than I did for the cost oh, of them. Um, and I was so excited about them. And then, and then suddenly there was like almost like a this huge, you know, scandal because how could you use these as candles? This is the level of detail. First of all, there's a kind of amber quality to the glass. It looks like it's um, aged and it gives a very warm light that makes women look beautiful and the complexion look beautiful. And men. Oh, more women. Okay. <laughs> it has a brass base which I wanted to create little touches of brass because that's the only little brass that I have in the space and it gives, lifts the whole place up and adds that element of class, which is the contrast that I wanted between the largely industrial sort of fishmonger space that was injected and fused with this old world kind of China that you would find on like the Queen Elizabeth or something like that. You know? So it was this, it was this, this is where drama comes from, is when you take the old and you put it in a warehouse. You know, the, when you put the luxury in the in the raw space, and I was completely like uh, singular in that in that in that decision because I wanted that to lift it all up, and they just couldn't get it. They just couldn't see how or why. They're like, what an ugly candle. So, so beyond the candle holders, if you no, no, I don't want <laughs> so to this. Let me talk about it a little bit more. Sorry. How sorry, sorry, that? Like, I don't mean it like that. I meant that I want to kind of. Uh, I got it get to that point, but move, like this, we have the candle holders now. I yeah. can continue with that yes. example. I can um, that let's that's assume you see. realize that a decision you've made, maybe something more consequential, though I do think candles are very important, um, is a wrong decision. Right. Um, and as you said, which I think is very healthy, there's all of us have a level of self-doubt. Right. Now, would you reverse that decision? Let's say you, you realize that, I don't know, something drastic, right? The bar was really not in the right place, and therefore the flow of the space is highly disturbed. Like for me, you know, being the, the, the designer and being the operations guy, I've always got to be sensitive. Like my managers will look at me like, "What are you doing? It looks beautiful, but it's completely not functional." Yeah, and I'm like, "Ah, it's fine. We'll make it work." But would you undo but decisions if you feel that they're? But we always actually end up having to make it work. I mean, right. primarily it has to work. So what I'm trying to say is, we're talking about aesthetics and function but then there's a commercial viability. It has to be operationally functional. 
So would you would undo certain decisions? If I you would feel find a way to. Yeah, I mean, I I've learned the hard way that it's very important to have a dishwashing area that works. Right. Because when you get really busy, trust me, it's like yeah. Armageddon. Yeah, the non-sexy stuff. Yeah, the non-sexy stuff. But you got to make the non-sexy stuff sexy. But I'm the guy now who's who's kind of I'm the middle point where I'm taking that. You know, I'm looking at this minutia, and I'm thinking, okay, well, is the drawer going to be able to handle all of these cutlery? You know, when I open it, is it going to fall? Uh, like this kind of stuff. So it's 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 that kind of perfect middle point between the beauty and the functionality. And on a level of one to ten, do you think you're a control freak? One <laughs> ten. Uh, you know, it's it's like. It's it's literally minutia to yeah. a level you cannot imagine. No, I can imagine actually, um, and I think it's important. I think it adds up to the bigger picture. It adds up to complete insanity. Like, beyond that, now we talked a little bit about. So you you know when you when you think about even Barbary, talked a little bit about the location. Yeah. Um, doing things that are a bit counterculture, counter trends. Yeah. To some extent, do you feel that is a, in your DNA essentially, or is that just the opportunity that presents itself now, and if I would give you a very obvious or more commercial, high density, you would go with it and embrace that. I mean, how much do you care about high density location? Yeah, for example, I mean, how much do you care about the, the counter trend concept that was, I think, in the DNA of, of the main and, and, and Barbara versus something you would do in the future? No, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm looking, for example, at a location for the main in, in downtown. Uh, I mean, downtown could be seen as commercial or high density or sure. selling out or I don't know. I mean, but at the end of the day it's not. I mean it's you know downtown needs a brasserie. I can right. do a brasserie. It's not you know So it's more about filling a void. It's really more filling a void. And quite honestly I live in this side of town and I still can you know like aside from here right. I think it's, it's very practical. I can't think of anywhere to go. Yeah. Um, and I don't really uh, I feel like the market needs to nurture more of that kind of counterculture homegrown brands. So moving from, from that to we talked a little bit about the audience and the customer base that you're targeting. Yeah. How much of that becomes a factor? So when, let's use Barbie as an example. Did you think, oh, I have the space and these types of people will show up or yes. I have the space, let me see what happens and I will adapt. Well, first of all, I thought of myself, I don't go to Provocateur and White and Hires. I, I don't personally. Right. Um, but, and I was looking around at Dubai and, I, and all the people that I would normally hang out with or that I would, you know, I was thinking, where do they go? And they used to go, they would go to one-off events, like right. Vibes and Electric Dreams and this and that. Yeah. And I was thinking myself, but where's the dedicated space for that? No. And so that was the first thought. thought. And then I was thinking, okay, well, how would I do this? Um, I remember walking into a Little Black Door, and I thought to myself, okay, there's no actually bar culture here. There's pubs, a lot of English pubs and Irish pubs. There is no cocktail bars. And then I was thinking, would I be satisfied doing the cocktail bar? No. Um, Why not? Because it's too, you know. Mono, well, no, it's too yeah. one, one minded. Yeah, I mean, if I would do a cocktail show. bar, I would do like a cocktail yeah, bar. Like, time, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like the. Uh, yeah. uh, like we'll give you the bathroom and you'll have a cocktail <laughs> bar. Yeah. yeah, that's it. But, but I, I felt that it needed more personality, it needed more dimension to it. Um, and I loved TCOM because TCOM is that weird, dirty, naughty place in Dubai that everyone knows if you leave your car for more than five minutes, it's gonna be covered with massage parlor and you know, like things. And I was just like, I love this. This is what I want. And I love the idea, it was like a joke to me, like I love the idea that, you know, DIFC people would have to schlep their way to to Barsha Heights because they want to be with the cool kids. I, for me it genuinely excited me. There was a masochistic element. Yes, hundred percent. Okay. So you you did that. Was were you on point? Were, were in terms of thinking about an audience? Yeah, I mean, there. You know, I think Barbary does does very well, but it's it's doing many things. So you can be good at everything. I think we did nightlife very well. We do drinking very well, even though the the, the bar needs more work. The food, people who ever come and like the food, love the food, but they're still not thinking of the place as, as in relation to a place that you can just go for a meal. Like it has to be a meal related to a party. We're, I still believe we're the only place in Dubai that successfully can transition between a meal and a party. Which is very difficult. Which, by the way, there are no other places that I could think of where you could go, except for maybe Bagatelle on a Tuesday night. 
where it turns into a party. Barbary is still the only place in the city where you can have a meal from 9 to 11, and at 11 you'll be standing up and dancing. If you could tell me one other place where you could do that, I will jump. I cannot think of a single place. Uh, I can't either. Well, this is in a city that is supposed to have the higher, per, highest per capita restaurants in, in the city. It's kind of crazy that there's no other you know location that's doing that. So, so another concept here, just another kind of, is that, I, which I, we see in Dubai all the time, yeah. not trying to be all things to all people. Like you can't you can hit every, you know, tick every box. Right? Yeah. You can't be the breakfast place and the lunch spot and the club and the bar. Pick your battles. For Pick sure. your battles. So you felt in, in both concepts, you, you knew what your main areas of, of yeah, I mean, focus I also, are. I also, you know, again, part of the photographic memory and listening to people. I listen to people a lot, even though I don't, I don't ask questions. I, li I just listen to them. And, and one of the things that kind of resonated with me was that I felt that in a city like this, you needed more safe spaces. People didn't want to feel um, harassed. Well, A, people don't want to be harassed. They don't want to be, feel like they have to spend a lot of money. They don't want to feel like they have to dress a certain way or act a certain way or be a certain type of person. They don't want to feel like um, it's pretentious or intimidating. Or you have a horrible or, uh, guy at right, the door. Or that there's just... a door policy, like you have to come with a girl or you have to come with a, like, you know, or you have to get a table. Or a minimum this. Or, or a minimum this or a minimum that. So, so a safe space was a very important kind of, uh, let's say, ethos for me in creating that. Um, and, I, and it was kind of rough because I got a lot of questions about doing that. Because people feel like there's a certain way you have to be because everybody else is that. Uh, and, and, and every business goes through growing pain, but you have to stick by your guns. You've got to protect your vision, even if you have to go through those weird transitional phases. If you believe it's the right way to go, don't be so uh, scared that you change things just because you have one bad weekend or because something happens. Uh, if your vision is to have, to create a safe space, then Protect that stick with it. Yeah, stick with it. One area we didn't talk about yet, which I think is very essential to uh, most establishments, so so, is staff and, and the kind of people you have. So yeah. we, we get a lot of, fortunately, very positive comments of people coming in here and saying, you know, we yeah. just love the staff. Yeah. It's personable, they know us. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your process with staff. How do you make choices? Well, we look for nice people. Okay. We'll start off with that. I mean, they're nice, they have to be nice. They have to be fun. They have to have, you know, it's interesting because they don't always appear fun coming into the interview process. So getting their, getting a sense of their character is really the whole thing. How and they you, evolve while they're how, in the place, right? Yeah, actually it is, but, but how, to, how to get a glimpse into their character during the interview process. Right. You need to spend more time figuring out the questions you ask rather than the answers you're looking for. You know what I mean? Like you need to get because the questions you ask really poke them to bring out that. You know, it's just about how you are, make them feel comfortable, try and get a sense of what kind of people they are. We get a lot of positive reviews about the team. You just need to find nice people who care. You need to incentivize them enormously. You know, we have. I mean, it seems silly, but we have an American tip style system. Can you define that for those that are not? Yeah, I mean, look, in Dubai, uh, majority of places have a pool based system which is, let's say you have five waiters, whatever tips they make, it goes into a pool and they share them equally at the end of the night. Right? Very democratic, very socialist. No, not democratic, more socialist actually. More a bit Canadian in a way. Yeah, well no. Actually, so the American style, style system is, it's your section, it's your real estate, this is your opportunity to make a lot of money, it's about the service that you give, and it's about how good you are. But it's also such that the one, one of the reasons that New York is not the only place where if you don't tip well, they throw it in your face. Right. I mean, it can become aggressive. No, hundred percent. Right? No, there is, there is. But you are breeding uh, a culture of entrepreneur culture. of entrepreneurs, um, where they believe that that is their real estate and they have to work for it, fight for it. You know, decisions like business decisions like that, like design decisions, can have a huge impact, like over time. So yeah, I mean, when I say about talk about minutia, I'm not just picking the door handles. I'm also deciding on essentially the culture of the of the company. How long do you think it takes until various staff members, whether it's in the kitchen, in front of house, back of house, 
you feel get the culture and what what do you do to create that ethos? I mean, you give them, you know, I don't know, a very, I mean, obviously training and all of that is part of it, I understand that, but culture is also more than that, subliminal, it's, it's... I've come to terms with the fact that it is entirely... In a transient city. Yes, a transient city, but it's also about, I have to keep driving it. It comes from me. And if I wake up one day and I'm tired and I don't feel like talking to anybody, it affects them. Mm. <laughs> they feel it, it trickles down into them. And then I can't blame them because they've gone off path or they, you know. I, I need to be always the, uh, the champion or the, the, the custodian of the, you know. The brand. Of, of the brand and of, yeah. the, of the, the, and the inspiration has to come from, the motivation has to come from within. So I'm acutely aware of that. I think that's probably the most complicated thing. And it's a scalability issue, right? Because the more you grow, right. the, the I mean, Then it becomes it's... about how you essentially inject that enthusiasm yeah. or in your managers and in, your... in that in the in, and, and essentially it's about training the trainer and how to how to kind of relay that through the culture of the company. Yeah, I mean so I remember reading about Danny Meyer in New York, who obviously enormously successful restaurateur, and him saying that at some point when the company became so large that he couldn't remember everybody's name in all his restaurants yeah, and started right, getting depressed right. because it, it just, you know, sheer scale of his restaurants. Right. Um, and what he then instituted, he tried to find different ways and he has a weekly meeting where all the newcomers come and meet him. He might not remember their name anymore, but at least he's had a face-to-face, -face, yeah. in-person contact with everybody. Right. Uh, and I guess that's an attempt to kind of balance that because as, as businesses grow and they need to grow, that familiarity becomes harder. Yeah, 100%. And it's going to be harder. I mean, 2019, we're opening two restaurants, so it's going to be. It's this is the this is the point by which I need to get smarter about how that works. And it's really it's really about hiring the right management, right, and spending time with them enough that they understand why it is what we do, and really understanding all of the decisions that have been made and why they. I think in explaining why people then buy into the into the culture. I feel like that's an important concept, especially in Dubai, where uh, owner operators are few. That's not the model. The model. Well, this is it. So this is what we were saying. So in Dubai, ninety percent of the restaurants are done by designers, branded by a branding agency. There's a PR agency doing the opening. There's a consultant coming in to tell them how to do it. It's a bastard child with no father, yeah. and then you wonder why. Then you wonder why yeah. there isn't... But, but, you know, but, but, but the other side of it is the flip side. I mean, we get this here all the time when, when we're not around and we're very, very proud to be owner-operated. We, we get people saying, where are you? Where, why have you been here the last two days? You could be yeah. traveling. Well, there, that is what it is. I mean, I love to travel. And, and I do wake up in a mood sometimes. And I try not to make it about me as much as possible. I don't believe that one restaurant, you know, now today, the main three years in is about me. It's, it's very much about the manager, the chef, and all the people working in it. It's not about me. But it's a different conversation when you're opening up two or three. You know, it's a different structure. It's a different conversation. It's a different... You have to assume a different role. And, and, and three years into the main and, and going to think about your friend, what's the one thing that keeps you up at night? And it can't be snoring or anything like that. I meant like, you know, no, I, I mean, meant in terms of the business. I mean, what keeps me up at night is... It's something I call legacy projects. The thing is, people don't realize the amount of time that it takes to develop one project. You know, I spent two years from the time I first saw the location to the time I opened the doors. Yeah, so did we. Oh, two right. years. Yeah, it's a lot of research, a lot of time. You know, and then one year to really kind of build it and get it to a space where where I thought that it was. So I spent three years of my life, and often I spent five, six years on a project before I could feel it's you know ready. So six years, I mean, you can only really do two of those projects a decade. So then I always ask myself, is the decision that I'm making in my next project just for fun, or is it my legacy project? Is it the thing that I'm happy investing my time in? Is it something that I will look back and say, that was time well spent, or was it spent in a... Because I don't do things for money. If I did, I'd be much richer. I do things because I enjoy doing them. I, I love the project. So yeah, so I often think about my legacy projects. How do you switch off in a business that's all been working every day, especially in Dubai? Well, I don't switch off by going to other restaurants because then it just makes me even crazy. Um, so how do you switch off? I switch off with a lot of meditation and training and, 
and uh, I mean, I, I do like you know my occasional night in. It's it's fun. So, um, but I love to try. I mean, I, that's my as an inspirational tool. Yeah. Okay. I I feel that I get so much from from traveling. I wish I could justify expensing it, but I can't because it would be a huge. <laughs> Uh, but I get so much from traveling and seeing different. I hope there's no shareholders here that are listening to. Yeah, um, that's my that's my biggest source of inspiration. They say that you know, uh, what is it? Uh, st stealing from one source is plagiarism, but taking from many is research. I'm on a, I'm, on, I'm constantly researching. Uh, on that note, I like the research note. We'll open it up to the audience to see if people have any questions. Uh, you wake up every day with this. Job with your work. What do you do when you wake up and you feel like ah, I don't feel like doing anything today? And what? I mean, how, what wakes you up in the morning? You ask what keeps you up at night. Look, I mean, the part of you know, part of being an entrepreneur, and I've you know, the last time I had a job was like a job that I had to be at every day was a long time ago, 15 years ago. And, and part of being an entrepreneur is it's not you're not clocking in and clocking out. You're you're essentially you're driven by deliverables. You know what needs to be done. You know what needs to be done, and you just have to do it. And if you don't do it, it's just going to keep building up. So you have to be disciplined in that respect. So I'm always doing something, and I'm always part of my last point about you know how long it takes to do a project. I'm always nudging myself or getting the ball rolling in a direction. I cannot tell you how many balls I'm rolling right now because only one of them will happen. But I'm literally nudging ten. Makes sense. Yes, makes a lot of sense. So I'm constantly nudging sort of something in one direction and talking about it and talking through and seeing where it goes and if it goes anywhere, great. If it doesn't, and it's fine. not, and then come back to you. Yeah, minutes. and I, I'm a big believer in, in if things are meant to be, they will be. I'm a huge believer in that, and I very much work on that kind of energy. And I cannot tell you the amount of times that something's not going right and then something just pops out of pure nothing and just presents me with a solution in a different direction or something's not going right and i'm presented with a conflict that i drives me to walk away from that so i'm, I'm very much driven by i'm very patient and i'm very driven by you know the energy the universe will tell me when something's meant to be in. i trust that that the universe will do right by me and i'll never push too hard if, if the universe puts too many obstacles in front of you. So you mentioned something earlier about that you always think about what excites you and you yes. play this song and you won't talk. Yeah. But don't you think that, like, as part of the whole, like, press on business, you think about how operationally functions everything is, you think about what excites the customers as well. So yeah, I mean, I'm always, I'm always, look, I am, I am my, I guess I'm my worst critic. I am my worst critic. I am the worst customer I have. Uh, so I'm always thinking that, whether I'm at other people's restaurants or my own. Um, and my entire, the whole reason why I do this is to make the customer feel something. And obviously, if they're not having a great experience, they're not feeling great. So that is my number one primary motivation. I'm not, you know, I'm not. I mean, that we all have different tastes, obviously. Right. You see something that I see differently, and right. maybe I'd like something different than yours. So yeah, but can I be honest with you? I don't design something for other people's tastes, and that's why I don't consult. I've tried consulting, and I don't really, I don't really like convincing that people that my way is right. Uh, if you want to work with me, it's because you trust that I have the right taste, and you'll let me do my thing. But if you want to do it yourself. Please do it. You also stitch by your own ideas, right? So if you have them, you might as well use them for, I mean, I your mean, own projects. I, you know, I get a lot of, I get a lot of, uh, like, I feel protective of, of, of ideas. It's not, you know, I have a lot of ideas. It's not really about ideas. It's about intuition. It's about something that I've been crafting and honing in on for 20 years. And I know that it's the right decision. And I don't know what to tell you. If you don't think that I, or you know better, then don't use me. I don't. It's it, it's an interesting it's an interesting question. The main has been there for like three years now, I guess. So is it like do you feel that it's like doing your comfort zone now? With the main that like when no. is the time to 
something Yeah, well, I'm doing, well, the thing is, it's funny, because I'm doing three more mains. Uh, so, but the thing about the main is, the main always was never a restaurant to me. The main was always a lifestyle concept. And I felt that I, if I was going to do more, that they would have different variations of themselves. They wouldn't be copies. Uh, so, it's a great story, but I have still so much more to say. And each main that you walk into now will have a different feel, but you will feel, or a different color palette, but you'll feel the same. Embroidery, because now you have like a better mood, you have like a different kind of night. So when do you feel that, like, yeah, like I need to do something new? Well, I'm following this. When do you feel what? When do you need, do you feel the need that you have to introduce a new event to a new... Yeah, it's a different animal. Nightlife needs to be constantly activated. You know, it needs to be constantly injected with uh, randomness and fun stuff and, 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 and you know, uh, activations and different touch points. And I, I literally, you know, working with social media and different people, constantly coming up with, constantly curating the identity of it. So it's, a, it's, it's something that's constantly changing and growing and moving forward. It's not one thing. It's not like a, you know, it's not an inanimate object. It's a living, breathing organism that changes with time. Um, and and there's a whole team of people that are constantly coming up with fun, quirky, random things. And I essentially just sit there and go, uh, not weird enough, need it weirder, not random enough, need it random, more random. This is, seems too contrived. I feel like I've seen this before. This is, I like this. Or... That seems like it's you know too try hard. Let's be a bit more. These are very intuitive um, decisions. There's no book for this. This is something that comes from I don't know a feeling. Yeah, because we're talking about fear, we're talking about feelings. Yes. I don't think you could ever be in your comfort zone. Yeah, so it's like either it's F and B or what's the right here or we tell you what's happening in the end. Right. And even with the main, I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, you know, the main's been three years. We've never done a single, ever done a single invitation of any kind printed in the last three years. Until last month, we sent out these, these oyster knives and, and invitations. We've never done advertising, we've never done printing, I have no collateral to speak of, there's no bags, there's no takeaway, there's no nothing, there's not a sticker. We have business cards, that's it. So, it's not because we need to do it, but well, I just but thought it'd right. be fun, right. it's something that just came up, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, you know what it is? It's something that I had stored in my mind for years, and I just called on it and thought, oh, that'd be cute, let's do that. You're talking about fear, about yeah. feeling, you're talking about emotions. Yeah. When I would say the last time you went to travel, you felt the emotions, you, mean you felt something special, yeah. and literally triggered something special in you. When was the last time you went to a place outside of here that made you feel special? All the time. I mean, uh, the summer's been very charged. I went to many, many places. Um, I mean, has anyone been to Burning Man? That was kind of special. <laughs> that made me feel a lot of things. Um, <laughs> what track, actually, I you know I came back from Burning Man. I'm not I'm ashamed to say that. I came back from Burning Man feeling very uh, confused because isn't that the whole point? Yeah, not because of the other thing, but because of there was not food. It wasn't about the food. I ate protein bars for seven for seven days. No, I'll tell you why I was confused. I was confused because I was in awe. I was in awe about what, how this thing grew to become what it is, and what these people have accomplished, and the sheer size and magnitude of it, and it made me feel very small, number one. Number two, it made me feel connected to something that was so big and so um, selfless that coming back to work, coming back to the real world, I felt like, what's the point? Like, this doesn't matter. And then I had to stab myself out of it, like, wait, I have a business, I have like, people, I have, like, you know, there's investors, there's, there's a report I have to write. Um, that shocked me because it completely realigned my understanding of what's important. But it's about balance, right? A bit of this, a bit of that. So I'm always uh, really fascinated with people who do like a million things. You're kind of like a James Franco of restaurants. Um, and I always ask this question, um, how do you organize your thoughts? And how do you prior what's your strategy of prioritization? And 
How do you remember everything that you're doing? Uh, not as well as I, I wish I could. Um, you know, it's very funny because now, you know, there's been a conversation for the last year about getting a PA. Mostly because my response time on emails is shockingly bad. And because I'm not able to do a lot of the things that I want to do. Like, write people handwritten notes when I get their business card. And things that are important to me. But that I simply can't do unless I had someone to write them or I thought about them. So it's, I guess it's a question of prioritizing what's really important, number one. Uh, number two, putting the right people in the right job. Right. And empowering them and having them report to you in a way that works for you. So people now know that email does not work for me. Do not send me an email because, you know, when I come home at 10 o'clock at night, I can't respond to 100 emails. I'll never go to bed. So don't write me an email unless it's something that's important with a document that I can say or call WhatsApp. So it's actually the way I work. I wake up in the morning, I start WhatsApping, delegating to the different people. I know what they have. I sometimes do lists in my phone. You know, when it's a very heavy week and I know that I'm on a deadline and I know that I need to do a lot in that week because it's a crucial week. Because the way that they, the way that it works with me is these projects sort of ebb and flow. Like sometimes it takes you about six months to like make all these decisions and negotiate all these things and then all of a sudden a bottlenecks. And suddenly in one week, everything happens. Everything yeah. mm -hmm. Nothing gives me more joy, by the way, than having an empty email inbox. Yeah. I mean, literally, that is the most yeah. exciting thing that happens to me. So, uh, you mentioned that you left uh, the, the job that you had 15 years ago and you decided to do your own thing. Yes. So, what happened at the time when you decided, okay, I'm not going to work for anyone anymore and I'm going to do my own thing? Many things happened. Uh, the, the, the recession started in 2008. Uh, there were a lot of cracks that were showing in the industry as a whole in North America. Uh, my father was diagnosed with cancer. Um, my partner at the time wanted to go off and become something else. And, you know, and there were so many things that happened. And also, but the main thing that happened was that I realized that I was 30, 28, 30 years old. And I wanted to, if I wasn't going to do it now, I would never do it. And I'd learned as much as I could. And if I didn't bet on myself, and if I didn't take this chance, and I'm a huge gambler, like I've taken crazy risks uh, in my life. Mostly because I don't have kids and I don't, you know, I don't have an enormous amount of, um, you know, obligations, so I could afford to take these risks. But, uh, but mostly I just decided that it was the right time. First of all, you're extremely inspiring and very authentic, and now I understand why your concepts are so authentic. My question is, when you look back, who is the one person that? Uh, Inspired to be in uh, Probably, if I had to pick one person, I mean, I'd say two people. One person was definitely my mother, because you know she's she's really the consummate entertainer. She always has been. You know, she's kind of the person that walks into a room and sort of takes over. You know, everybody's going to be her friend whether they like it or not, and she's just going to she she knows how to start the party. She's always been like that. Um, She's always been the, the consummate entertainer. She, would, she knew how to make the spread. She was always kind of innovating and kind of creating in a certain way, different ways to excite people uh, at home. Um, and the other person I think that's always inspired me is uh, my first boss. He was a very big character. Um, he was a bit of a genius in his field. Uh, he was also a very temperamental character and very, he had a lot of faults, I'll be honest. Uh, but he, the one thing that he had was he was infectious. He was, he knew how to get everyone's attention. And he was highly creative. So uh, he's definitely another person that I would say inspired me. But there haven't been that many people that affected my life that much. Yeah. Just two, three people that I can think of, maybe a handful at the top of my head. That have kind of, I suppose, that have nudged me in certain directions. Many more years to come. On that note, thank you. That's been a wonderful uh, conversation. Thank you. Yeah. We'll
the time here. Yeah. We we have a, a little gift for you. Um, it's a gift to store after all, and it's your third anniversary of the main. Thank you so much. Um, and it's sort of rather dark conversation. So it's a book? yes, it's a book. Is it about how to design restaurants? You can open it. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to open it. But um, yeah, opening gifts. Well, you know, it's handwritten as well. So so <laughs> handwriting is terrible. <laughs> I'll type it next time. But thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, thank you thank for coming. You. And we do those. Uh, it was actually kind of fun at the end. Of it. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> we do it uh, every couple of weeks. So please follow us on social media and uh, come to the next one early oh, next year. Right. Yeah. The eye. Yeah. 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 Thank you.